Welcome back to the Music Career Show. Um, my guest today has been quite a big inspiration for me in my own career in music. He's a very accomplished multi-instrumentalist as well as engineer and producer. I first came across his work when I saw a video of him in the folk duo The Other Favourites performing their song The Levy. And from then on, I was just completely sold on everything that this lad does. I've been looking forward to this one for quite a while, so please welcome Mr. Josh Turner. How are you, Josh? I'm all right. Thanks for having me, Barry. It's an absolute pleasure to have you, my man, an absolute pleasure. Like I said, I've been wanting to to meet you and speak to you for uh, a good long while. And even if it is only over the medium of uh, the internet, that, that that's good enough for me. I'm glad, I'm glad to be able to have a chat with you. So for people that may or may not have heard of you um, just just yet, why don't you introduce yourself and tell, tell us a bit more about what it is you do? Um, well, I mean, you covered the bases pretty uh, concisely there at the at the top. But uh, I, uh, my name is Josh Turner. I um, live in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, for the last 15 years, I've been posting videos on YouTube of myself playing music, um, either solo or with other people. And uh, over the last five or so years, uh, that's become my full time job. So I'm um, I I'm, I call myself a producer, uh, a YouTuber, a guitarist. Um, and an arranger, a singer, uh, basically everything that you need to be able to do in order to have a YouTube channel be sustained for 15 years. <laughs> I love it. Um, so, uh, so, so yeah, that's, uh, that's me. And then I, and I also tour, um, mostly in support of the, the stuff that's on the YouTube channel. Uh, as you mentioned, I, uh, have toured, uh, well, I, I work a lot with, uh, Carson McKee as the duo of the other favorites. Um, and so I tour for that. I tour with, uh, Josh and Allison, um, a singer, Allison Young, who has also appeared on my channel. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, in the past, have uh, toured with some Paul Simon tribute shows, um, which I'm not currently doing. But uh, yeah, I just try and basically say yes to as many things as I can. Sounds like a plan. I, I remember when you were doing the Paul Simon tribute show because you done a show in Aberdeen, where I live. We in did, Scotland. yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I filmed a video to... in Aberdeen, actually. Did you? Mm-hmm. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I missed did... that one. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I, I filmed in. Oh, what was the name of the concert hall we were in? The music, uh, uh, not the music hall. His Majesty's Theatre. Um, I don't remember. It, it had sort of like a 1700s kind of vibe, but very, very nice interior, sort of rectangular, like a Protestant church on the inside. And, yeah. uh, and, uh, yeah, I think it's just called the Music Hall of Aberdeen. I, I do remember the Paul, the, the Paul Simon, um, the Paul Simon thing. So that, that's fantastic. Uh, and I do want to talk about that in, in a bit. But, um, I'd like to just reverse back a little bit because I, is it true that music wasn't really meant to be your thing at all? Yeah, I mean, um, I come, like most musicians, you know, th- there is some music in my family lineage. My mm-hmm. grandparents, uh, my maternal grandparents uh, were both professional musicians. My grandpa was a college professor uh, teaching music and, and conducting choirs, and my grandma was uh, an accompanist and organ player. And, um, you know, but it was it was never it was never a sure thing. Nobody in my immediate family does music professionally. And um, so uh, I wanted to be a car designer for most of my childhood, right up until the time that I ha- basically had to start applying for, you know, universities. And, uh, and I kind of had a last minute epiphany that I was n- no good at either art or math. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of, I, you know, I, I chose a very general, uh, major, um, which was digital media production when I first got to school got to, cool. you know, got to university and a minor in music because I, you know, I, I had always been interested in it and I, it had been fostered in me because of this, this family connection. Mm. Um, but I was, you know, in a funny way, like I just enjoyed music so much in high school and as a kid that I didn't want to ruin my enjoyment of it by turning it into, you know, a career or, or, a, or a field of study. I had heard kind of horror stories of, of people who'd gone to conservatories and um, had wound up you know, being sick of their instrument, basically, by the time that they graduated. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I didn't, you know, immediately pursue that path, even when I realized that car design was never going to be my future. Um, But, you know, after about two years uh, at the university and and taking classes in my minor in music and realizing that actually, I really did enjoy them. And it was not, you know, squashing any interest that I may have had in in what I was learning. um, I wound up just flipping my major and minor. So I I majored in music, minored in digital media, and, um, and and I feel like I'm in the distinct minority of people my age who are directly using both their major and minor um, from from university pretty much every day now for my for my job. 
Okay. Um, I'm going to sound really, really um, stupid here now, but can you explain what a major and a minor is in university? Because I don't think we have those terms over this end of the world. I think that's more of a, a more of an American term. Yeah, sure. And I never, I never really understood it. I've, I've heard it in like films and stuff, but I never really understood what that meant. Yeah, well, it's um, it's probably a bit arbitrary, but basically, your major um is your primary area of focus, and it's the thing that you become specialized in. So, um, I went to a liberal arts school, so everybody, almost everybody, is getting some sort of uh, you have to take a bunch of general courses, basically, no matter okay. what your your primary area of interest is. So, um, I was a a bachelor of arts in music is what my is what my degree was called, um, yeah. which basically means I took the most general music classes possible, and then also took you know chemistry and I took a class on robot programming or something to fulfill a math requirement. Um, wow! It was it was the thing that I could, which allowed me to evade you know direct math the most was what it felt like to me at the time. But you yeah, know, and then like uh, you had to take a sociology class and you know and and. Uh, things like that. But so yeah, so your major is is what you wind up being focused on most of the time and it dictates what types of classes you have to take. Your uh-huh. minor is basically an extra. Um if you, you know, if you want to focus on something that isn't just your major, it's the way that you can sort of formally do that. I don't think that to any employer or anybody in the real world minors ever mean much, you know, it's it's pretty much just an opportunity for you to to study a, a secondary thing. Um but uh but yeah, that's 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 what the sort of structure is all about there. Cool. Well, well, th- well, thanks very much for clearing that up for me because I'd always heard about it in, like I said, I'd always heard about it in films, but I never really fully understood what it actually was. And I feel a bit silly for asking now because, of course, the major is the thing that you focus on and the minor sort of isn't. But, you know, it's one of those things you don't know until... <laughs> if, if you don't know, you don't know. I, I, yeah. I never went to university myself, so I didn't really... It, it, the whole how the whole university structure, it, I I never understood it because I never went, so I didn't really. Um, but anyway, I mean, yeah. I'm sh- I'm sure I'd be equally baffled by uh by UK university structuring. So you know, I well uh, same here, same here. <laughs> I'm from Ireland, and the UK system of of schooling is totally totally different from from the way it is in Ireland. So um yeah, even when I've I've got students here coming in and talking to me about what they did in school and they're in like all, all the, the the way that they, they label classes and stuff is totally different to the way we do it and everything. So, but hey ho, I just wanted just the 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 different differences in in where we are in the world. But so. Cool. So you were you were you were meant to be uh well meant to be in kind of the bunny years uh meant to be a car designer but music kind of started coming in. So so did, were you self taught in your in your first instrument or what was the crack? Yeah. Um. For the most part. Um. Well, actually, no, no. My first instrument was piano. Uh, I took oh. piano lessons for five years, and uh, and it it was it was satisfying in that like you know i think that i had a general musical instinct that i was able to express through piano um but learning the instrument itself was it was never intuitive for me it was every every phase of it was difficult and when i was 13 after having taken piano for about 5 years um my dad is a sort of casual guitar player he he right. was you know playing your beatles and your simon and garfunkels and stuff around the house occasionally when i was growing up mm. and um so he had a guitar lying around and i um i decided to to try and pick that up and, and learn a couple of chords uh at one point it's a, i feel like there's there's just almost a um, a genetic predisposition in like 13 year old young men to want to pick up the guitar um yeah. and that very much set in for me at that time and uh and i realized within just a couple of weeks that it just made more sense to the way that my brain works for some reason than piano ever did even after five years um and so uh i you know whereas with piano i had had to uh be disciplined and my parents had had to implore me to practice and i was going off of lesson books and all the rest of it yeah the guitar i just i just couldn't put down and i was i was far more motivated to to learn it myself um and you know it's what the music that i was excited about and the music that I was listening to sounded like, you know, the, yeah. the, the ability to um, partake in things that were so cool and exciting to me within a relatively short period of time on the guitar made it, you know, it made the learning process much more gratifying. Yeah. Because, you know, you, you may not be able to play um, the opening solo from which you were here very well in your first year of playing guitar, but you can still play it. The notes yeah, are you, recognizable, you know. Yeah, you and that's that bad. All right, that's you know, and and with piano, it's you can't just like oh, it's like well, okay, I love Debussy. Like you can't just you can't even get in the universe of that in one year, yeah. you know. Um, so anyway, uh, 
so so I was self-taught for a long time. Um, we had a series of books here in the U.S. that was very popular in the in the late '90s and early 2000s called The Complete Idiot's Guide. Um, oh, and I had so, one of those. I had one you? of those. I, yeah, I got on holidays when I was in Florida at about yeah, the you. age of like 13, 14. So, so there you go. You, you, you hit it right at the top of the zeitgeist there. Uh, and so, yeah, I was learning off of the Beatles Complete Easy Chord book and, uh, and then the Complete Idiot's Guide to Guitar <laughs> for, for a yeah. while. Um, and, uh, and, you know, honestly, they were pretty, pretty helpful, pretty well written. And, uh, and after I'd been at that for about two years, uh, my parents put me in uh, some lessons with just a local teacher in town who, um, you know, he, he was from more of a, a jazz background, but he was a really good sport about kind of following what I was interested in. And I wasn't really ready to learn theory and jazz harmony and stuff like that yet. So what I would usually say is, Hey, I've got this piece by some finger style guitarist. I'd like to, I'd like to learn how to play this. And, uh, you know, he would take it home, he would tab it out, he would think, figure out how to play it. And then the next week he would, he would show me through it. And, you know, and every new piece that I would learn had, uh, you know, some element that was implementable to my broader skill set as a guitar player. Uh, and so I was sort of, uh, assembling a like a like a buffet plate of of knowledge, I guess you could say, from these yeah. different uh, from these different songs that I was learning during that period of time. You know, it's still very much by ear driven though, and uh, and it wasn't until I went to university that I finally took some some classical guitar tuition and to, like classes. And um, and by the time I, I got to university my first year, my you know my teacher was trying to assess my skills and and he was saying, well, you know, you're playing at basically a graduate level and you have uh, a absolute novice level of music reading. So we're going to try and <laughs> we're going yeah. to try and rec- rectify the disparity between those two things. And um, I, I am a marginally better music reader now, but I, I still prefer to do things by ear. It usually just feels yeah. more um, sounds very very for familiar. Me, so. I, yeah. I, I think most of us guitar players out in the world are, are exactly the same. We haven't a, no, we haven't a clue about theory because we don't need to because whoever the first guitar player to come up with tab uh, must have just hated theory and he's like, there must be a simple way, simpler way of doing this. Yeah, for um, sure. Yeah, I, I do always have some crack trying to explain to, to new students the difference between tab and notation, especially when they're sitting on top of each other. And oh, then, yeah. Uh, yeah. So every good, every good boy deserves fun. So what do you think that is? Oh, is that the five strings on the six string guitar? And you're like, no, no. Right. Um, right. Yeah. It's interesting. <laughs> but trust you, me, but trust me, it's important. You need to know. <laughs> yeah, it is important. It, it's, it is so important. We'll try and explain that to a, to a seven year old who has just gotten their, their head around the fact that there's six strings on the guitar and the tab is upside down from what it, it should be, but sure. Right. I know it's it's a nightmare. It's it, it, it's interesting you should say that about the piano that you 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 think it's kind of wired backwards from how your brain is. I'm exactly the same. I'm the to- I, I'm I'm coming from the other end, and that I'm self taught in guitar. And when I tried to learn piano, it's completely backwards from from how I would do it because what mm-hmm. would not what what my left hand would normally be doing, my right hand is now trying to do, and it's, uh, yeah, right, absolute, right, right, right disaster disaster altogether but um so you you started off guitar you went into university you then kind of got 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 places with your music theory and booked up your knowledge a bit where did the likes of because i know you play mandolin you play banjo you play a couple of other bits and bobs um where did they all come in um pretty much everything else was self-taught um my uncle so the son of the musical grandparents who is my mom's brother just to get the lineage all straight here um he was a banjo player um he uh he's still around he just doesn't play much banjo anymore um and so i i grew up with cassette tapes that he would uh, that he would make he would rip off old lps onto cassettes uh, which i feel truly ancient uh, describing this as what i was growing up on but uh-huh. he would rip i would rip lps onto cassettes for me and i would i would often time just listen to uh tapes of solo banjo like while i was falling asleep as a kid um so i you know probably some like subliminal banjo messaging uh was going on there but uh he and he specialized in uh old time banjo uh which uh if you i don't know how familiar you are with banjo but that's uh one of the like the one of the less popular less sort of blitzy uh styles of banjo it's uh played without finger picks it's not it's not what earl scruggs is doing it's uh it's an older version uh, of of playing the banjo from uh, the Appalachia region of the U S for the most part. And, uh, so that's what uh-huh. I started out with was, uh, old time banjo. Um, and, uh, then eventually I started working on the Earl's Krug's finger pick type stuff as well. Um, and yeah. And then, you know, right around that, that time, uh, shortly, the shortly after I'd taken up guitar, uh, 
I picked up banjo, I don't know, maybe six months after that. Right. And right around that same time period, 13, 14, my family uh, moved states uh, and we moved from Indiana in the, or from Ohio in the, in the Midwest of the U S to North yeah. Carolina, um, which is very much sort of culturally in the South of the U S. And so okay. I fell in with a couple of musicians at that time, including Carson, um, who were much more steeped in sort of country Americana bluegrass music than I was. And that was what propelled me to start learning the Earl Scruggs style banjo for the first time. That's what propelled me to pick up the mandolin for the first time, um, just because yeah. that was the, t the type of music that was in my ears a lot more so um, when I when I moved to North Carolina. And then, you know, bass, bass yeah. is just the bottom four strings of the guitar. Every guitarist can play bass. And, um, yeah. and then, you know, and then I guess I do consider myself as much a singer as anything. And, um, and I joined a boys choir first when I was nine years old and then sang in choirs, you know, basically all the way through school, so. Oh, cool. So you mentioned um, Carson McKee there. Um, some of my favorite videos and some of my favorite covers of all time have been uh, from, from you guys. I was only listening back today. Um, Take It Easy uh, and stuff like that. Um, and there was one you did when I think we were in Prague of Bad, Bad Leroy Brown. There was that was, was Rena with you there as well. Um, yeah, yep. So how, how did um, how did you and Carson get started? Was that your kind of first duo or were you in bands before that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, in the earliest days of, of playing guitar, I was m much more interested in solo guitar repertoire. Um, I, I love the music of Leo Kotke and John Fahey and uh, Davy Graham. Um, and meeting Carson when I was uh, 15, I guess, was the first time that uh, there was a reason for me to want to play in an ensemble because I had met this guy who, you know, e even at that age, uh, had a great voice and, and was a... Um, a solid, you know, a solid guitar player, you know, mostly rhythm guitar and stuff. But, yeah. um, but it was the first time that I'd met someone who was just like, Oh, okay. Like we're, I think kind of on the same level in some ways here. And, uh, and so I started, uh, trying to orient my playing a little bit more around, around working in a duo, you know, from that, from, from that moment onward. And Carson and I have, have essentially just continued, uh, as a duo ever since, um, I think throughout high school, it was funny. In, in high school, we were actually a quite we were quite serious about uh, music, relatively speaking. We didn't we weren't really pursuing gigs. We weren't really interested in the the business aspect of it. Um, but we loved uh, recording. We put out um, an album and, a, and an EP. I think while we were in high school, that you know we took very very seriously recording in GarageBand and stuff like that. Um, but uh, and and we actually had a third member of the group as well originally. Uh, oh. his name was Cole Gage, and he was a he was a mandolin player. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so when, when we went to college, you know, Carson and I, uh, university, we went to, uh, university in different States. And, uh, so it became a much more sporadic thing. And, and I often say to people, you know, I think, uh, it looks like Carson and I were much more involved professionally during those university years than we really were because yeah. in reality, every time we got together, we would record a couple of videos, you know, so one could get the impression that it was happening, you know, much more regularly than it was. But in fact, yeah. in most cases, we would get together, arrange something and shoot it in the span of three hours or something like that, and then not see each other for six more months. Well, um, but so then after, uh, after we both graduated from university, uh, I lived in Indianapolis for a year, uh, where my university was, and then came to New York and Carson, uh, moved here shortly after I did. And, uh, so, you know, what had been very, very casual throughout college, uh, we started to get a lot more serious with once we moved here. Um, and, you know, so we were, we were gigging around the city periodically. It wasn't until 2018 that somebody reached out to us and, uh, and said, Hey, I want to actually, you know, book you some tours and stuff like that. And so that was the point at which it became, much more serious. But so as a result, I mean, that working with Carson had kind of been my primary focus from, you know, since being a kid, I've had other projects, other duos, other bands uh, that have, that have sort of risen and fallen over that uh, yeah. period of time. But that's, that's been the through line of my, of my career for sure. Fantastic. And so one question I wanted to ask uh, that I was always really interested in from listening to your covers over the years, was that like, basically, where do you get the, the ideas for your covers? Because they're not just to give you some context, I'm 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 in a band as well. I play in, in a duo. I play mandolin, um, electric mandolin and electric guitar, and sometimes harmonica with a, a bandmate of mine. Same as you, really. Uh, Callum is my bandmate. Really, really good singer. Really, really good solid rhythm guitar player. But our covers don't sound anywhere near as creative or as original as what some of your stuff does. Do you 
plan out like what you're going to play or do you literally just sit down and jam and see what comes out? Um, it depends. I think in most cases, uh, I plan things out. Um, you know, the, the dynamic that Carson and I developed as a duo, uh, was very much that I think, well, for a long time, it was, it was divided along the lines of he was the songwriter and I was the arranger. Um, yeah. and so, you know, when, when we were doing original music, it sort of fell more into his camp. And then we, when we were doing covers, that was sort of my creative arena more so. So, yeah. you know, having studied classical music, uh, I, that is always sort of the approach that I, that I take when we sit down to do a cover. Like, you know, one of the most recent ones we did was, um, son of a preacher man, which was made famous yeah. by dusty Springfield. And, uh, so, you know, in the case of that, I, I knew, so, you know, my, my thought process was I'd like to do a cover with Carson. Um, it's more fun for me, and I think it's more fun for the internet when we do covers that are uh, unexpected or that don't usually uh, live within mm-hmm. the sort of folk bluegrass domain. Yeah. So I was just I was listening around to you know the the first step for me is always finding a song that um, I just think is a great song you know that mm-hmm. uh, that I enjoy listening to on its own merit, and uh, and then trying to find the line of um, this is something that could it work basically is the next question. So cool. question one is, do I like the song? You know, that's, that's where, what we have to start with. Question two, is there a way that this could be adapted? If, if I strip a lot of elements from the original away, can it still have what makes it successful, you know, at its core? Um, if it's just two guys and, and two, two instruments. Um, mm. And so I decided, you know, in the case of Son of a Preacher Man, I was like, okay, well, here's a great song. Um, you know, here's a way I could, I could kind of swing the tempo without, um, without actually changing the tempo too much. So the way that the text fits doesn't really change that much, but the feel changes because it goes from being, you know, um, to, uh, you know, the, yeah. the quarter note is in the same place, but the whole mood of the song changes when you kind of double time it like that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, so now it's like, okay, now we're starting to, get into the place of, of how, you know, of making it our own and making it interesting. Um, I have to find a good key for Carson to sing in, uh, sing lead in that usually comes next. Um, and then figure out a way that it can fall on the guitar for me. Um, that, uh, that is both ergonomical and also interesting, you know, and I then oftentimes dictate to Carson, you know, play it capo this, you know, play it these chord shapes and whatever. I yeah. had him do that. Like the, there's a capo move halfway through the song that, um, that I suggested that he do just to, you know, keep the flavor of the song interesting. And, um, nice. and, and, and then, yeah. And then, you know, because I come from a vocal background as well, I thought it'd be fun to do this like shout chorus thing at the end of the song where we kind of like, well, it's, it, that comes straight from like bluegrass gospel where people, where you kind of layer lines on top of each other, you know? So since yeah. there was already this obvious call and response aspect to the chorus, I thought like, okay, let's just, smash that together and have it kind of happen on top of on top of itself um and uh so yeah so i mean like it's a it's actually a fairly analytical process for me usually when i'm trying to come up with an arrangement i'm thinking of it in terms of um compositionally basically um how how can i recompose the piece just for the two of us yeah, well, I, I'm 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 glad that that's what that's what the answer was, and that you didn't just wake up with these amazing compositions, <laughs> because no. that that would just be completely <laughs> no. really unfair on the rest of us. Um, I've 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 watched the the Son of the Preacher Man video a couple of times, and um, I never noticed the the capo change. Uh, I'm obviously not watching or listening very intently, or intently enough, I should say. But um, I, th- I think that's just a compliment. That means he did, he did it very smoothly, is all. Yeah, well, then there you go. It, it it obviously does. So that that brings me perfectly into my next question because, in that video in particular, and other videos that I've seen you do over the years, you seem to use just one microphone and get such a massive, huge, like perfectly rounded sound. Um, every single time so like is that just like number one are you literally just using that one microphone for starters and number two how how are you getting that sound so uh you know i I should say that i guess concurrently with my journey as a musician um i have developed a real love of recording and of engineering and uh i just i love just kind of sounds in general and uh and you know i i think that it makes a lot of sense that when you are listening very, very closely to the music that you love, you can start to differentiate uh, 
between the sounds of various recordings and you start to connect that it's it's not just what's being played but how it was recorded that yeah. that makes you connect to the music you know um and and it's a funny thing with with recording because it's just like with you know live performances of music the most correct you know the clearest cleanest most correct sounding version may not be the most emotionally compelling version um you know he hearing somebody um you know hearing a midi instrument play hey joe is is not going to deliver the same impact as hearing it you know be played with like yeah. bends that don't quite make it there and like distortion and all the rest of it you know yeah yeah and so it's this, it's the same way it's the same way with recording and, and i i've just been increasingly fascinated and drawn to you know figuring out how to record things in such a way that the recording itself is heightening the emotional impact of the of the the song and of the performance and so, um, so, you know, I mean, since a lot of me and Carson's, uh, since that's just sort of what we've been talking about, me and Carson's arrangements are fairly minimal. Um, and I think that it makes sense for the recording approach to match that. And so in the early days, we were doing things with one microphone out of necessity um, mm -hmm. because it was cheap, you know, and it requires a pretty limited skill set. And now I'm doing it because I actually, I like the limitation of having only one mic or, you know, a stereo microphone, um, because it requires us to, uh, it, it, it requires us to play to a higher level, quite frankly, um, because you need to be able to balance yourself around the microphone. You, the, the, your ability to mix things and make adjustments after the fact is, uh, significantly reduced. And, yeah. um, and so, you know, I, over the years, uh, I started recording with a Zoom H2, which is a tiny little plastic, you know, it looks like a toy, basically. I know it um, well. I, I know it very, very well. I still, I still love them. I still uh, advocate for the Zoom H2, and, uh, and I still use them sometimes to record. It's nice for me to kind of check back in and, and make yeah. sure that I can still get a great sound, you know, just with a, I mean, you know, you can get one that is basically mint condition for $80 or something like that now. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I the the first trick is to uh, get the placement of the microphone uh, in such a way that it balances the voices in the instruments as well as possible before you've done any processing on the audio. Um, and you know, for a long time, that took me many tries to kind of I would do a test recording of like let's sing a verse and a chorus, and then I would move the mic down a foot and let's sing a verse and a chorus, and oh, it needs to be closer to you. Let me tilt it this way a little bit more. Let's tilt it left or right or whatever. Um, and you know, nowadays I've done so much of that type of thing that I have a pretty good instinct for um, how to get the placement without having to do a ton of tries. But placement yeah. is always number one. And then after that, um, you know, I, I put it into Pro Tools, um, and I usually do a little bit of um, EQ if that feels necessary, just to you know brighten it up or or, or make the t you know the bass sound bigger or whatever. I'll do some compression, uh, almost always, which is definitely part of where the the, the quote unquote bigness of the sound comes from. Um, and then, you know, that's usually just about it. Um, you can also get tricky with, uh, rebalancing some of the instruments by, uh, changing the level and pan of the right and left microphones on a stereo yeah. recorder, like the zoom H2. Um, there, you know, there'll be moments where, I mean, I try to make them basically imperceptible, but sometimes if something was really quiet, um, it, just in one channel, I'll have to turn that channel up, but then so yeah. that the stereo image doesn't get weird, I have to throw that channel towards the center and turn the other channel down. So the way that it just comes off is that it almost sounds like the mix just collapses to mono for, you know, a couple of seconds and then goes back to stereo again, um, which is something that I think most people would never notice in a million years. Um, no. but that's, you know, that's, that's something that I only reach for if it's really, really necessary to try and keep the balance, um, you know, stable i guess between, yeah, yeah. between what you're seeing and what you're hearing and that's what it's always subservient to is um i think more than anything um whatever changes and manipulations i may do to uh, a single mic or a stereo mic i always check it against the video um, before i post it to make sure that it feels natural and it feels yeah. plausible and that you know i don't i don't want what people are hearing to be a distraction from the video i want to have it feel like they're in the room and getting you know, basically an idealized version of exactly what it sounded like. So, yeah, well, I, I, I think mission accomplished there. Um, 
that's that, that that's all amazing stuff. I I studied sound engineering in when, when I said earlier on, I never went to university. I went to college, which over this end of the world is apparently two different things, and I never knew that. But um, apparently it is. Um, and I I studied sound engineering for 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 two years. So when you're talking about like leveling, like like pan into the center and then turning up the 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 right the right side, I suppose. I was all I, I'm so into all that nerdy stuff, and uh, I, yeah. I, I think it's, I, I think that's really really clever because I always wondered was like. First of all, the the Zoom H one, when, when, or was it? No, sorry, the H one is a smaller one. The H two, um, I was like, he must be using it like even even like in a figure of eight sort of um configuration or something like that. Um, and I'm glad, yeah, that's yeah. We 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 could sit here and talk about um about about uh, recording techniques and stuff all all night. Uh, however, I don't think that would serve anybody. <laughs> no. Uh, but uh, I'll, yeah, I'll, no, give you, I'll give you one more fun one though. This I'll give you one more yeah. fun one. This is just for you, uh, and you can decide whether to air this or not. But Love it. Uh, on my on my video of the only living boy in New York, I was using the Zoom H two for that, and I was standing in a in a uh, stone tunnel. But yeah, and, on, the, on uh, the bridge, wasn't it? That's right. So, yeah. uh, and on that one, so the the H two actually has four capsules in it, and it can basically record in surround sound, which is just insane for being such a cheap device yeah. from two thousand seven. Um, and so, what I did on that one was uh, I was recording all four microphones uh, the whole time, and then during the verses when there's text, uh, I would I would just turn up the front two microphones only, the ones that were facing me. And then on the sections where it's just, ah. there's sort of like this Gar- Garfunkel choir, I turn the front mics all the way down and I turn the back mics up. So you're only uh, getting the, the reflected reverb. ambient sound. Yeah. Uh, and then I, so then, you know, um, y- the, your listeners won't be able to see here, but basically you're just flipping which mics you have on during the, the different portions of the song. So there's all kinds of ways that you can get clever uh, with, with a minimal mic setup. That's so, it's, it, and you know what? That's like the most, like straightforward and and simple thing but if you use it correctly um that, that that's amazing and again i'm glad that you haven't just like kind of woken up in the morning and decided i'm going to be phil Spector today and be really really clever that is, it, it literally is such an accessible skill you just need to be you need to have the wits about you and the cleverness to actually be like oh just do that it, it's going to sound well, amazing i mean the one thing that i will say about that though is that you know it's a it's a funny thing with my channel where like I think that part of my part like part of the product that I'm giving people is is the impression that I'm just sitting down and like having fun with my friends, yeah. and that is always true that there's all that there's always an element of of truth to that you know I yeah. I almost always am actually either either friends or at the very least friendly with all of the the people that I record with. Yeah. Um, I always try and budget in enough rehearsal time that everybody really feels comfortable. And, you know, and if it's a shoot with a bunch of people, I'll, you know, I'll serve some wine and whatever. Um, and so, yeah. you know, that is real, but the casualness of it, um, is, is, is oftentimes kind of where the illusion comes in because the reality is a great deal of preparation, uh, and a great deal of forethought goes into making things feel casual, you know, yeah. and, and making people feel comfortable, you know, um, yeah. I want, I, I, I have to think about how I can do a shoot in such a way that, that people will appear comfortable on camera, um, and, you know, feel prepared enough and things like that. So, so yeah, there, there's plenty going on behind the scenes for sure. Um, and, uh, but, but, you know, that doesn't detract from the the realness of the, of the actual, you know, spontaneity that you, that you do see as well. So. Yeah, no. Uh, so one of my favorite ones is um, when you were doing Bad Bad Leroy Brown. I think you were in Prague, and it was a Carson was just kind of walking in and out of the of 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 the scene, just like but but like that and stuff. <laughs> that was that was so much fun. I think what, did you do second? He, he did. He did come up with that idea on the day actually. Oh, did yeah, he? yeah, that, yeah. That, and see that did look just like so much like you were just literally just having the crack, and you were just floating about Prague. Um, just with nothing else to do, come on, sure, we'll 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 record an old song and and have a bit of crack. Um, speaking about the Zoom H two, um, I love Zoom stuff as well. I'm currently talking to you on a Zoom L twelve. Um, I think it's nice. absolutely fantastic. I had a Zoom H five for years, and I had an R O. What was it called? The R sixteen, I think. The R sixteen, the white one. Oh yeah, the little the little standalone recorder. Yeah. And they're they're amazing for the money for the money you pay the um like you say eighty quid for the H two and you've got how many four capsules in it yeah <laughs> amazing absolutely amazing and outstanding have you ever thought or, or have have Zoom ever approached you about getting any sort of sponsorship deals or anything along those lines yeah actually yeah I um I've I've worked with Zoom for several years now um 
there there's some music retailers uh, in the U.S. where it's <laughs> I've gotten their catalog in the mail and I've spotted my own hand uh, on the oh, ad cool. for the L twelve. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I'm in oh, the, fantastic. I'm in some of the U.S. Uh, like print ads for the for the Zoom L twelve, um, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, their, their headquarters are out on uh, Long Island, which is, uh, it's, I don't know, an hour and a half or something from where I am here in Brooklyn. Um, so I, I've met, I've met the, some of those folks have done shoots with them in the past. And, uh, you know, I think it kind of frustrates them a little bit that, I'm, that I won't stop using the H2 because I think they would very much like me to use a product that they currently sell. Um, yeah. but, uh, but no, but, but I've also got their, um, I've got their sort of flagship uh, recorder for video called the F8N. And uh, that thing is just is just extraordinary it's uh the the build quality is completely pro level you know you you could drop it off a cliff and it feels like it would it would keep working and um and you can you can control all of the um basically everything you can uh, set up a monitor mix and you can record play pause from a bluetooth app on your phone um which oh, is brilliant. super super helpful so um when i've done outdoor shoots uh, so actually son of a preacher man i i wanted to use a, a really class high-end phantom powered condenser mic and so i was using uh the f8n as the interface on that one and uh or like things like uh oh lori um which was one i did a couple of months back where i had um, a bunch of singers and a, and a jazz like rhythm trio i needed more inputs so yeah so we were using the f8n on that and uh it runs on battery but it's i mean just, just pro quality outside. It's crazy. Yeah, I was, I was going to say something along those lines would be absolutely ideal for you when you're out and about doing, um, doing all your shoots and stuff. That's that, that's that's fantastic. Um, and yeah, that that is hilarious. That that Zoom are kind of like, would you not just like use it because they're up to like the H6, or do they still even produce the H6? Yeah, but, the, yeah, but it's it's pretty long in the tooth. They've got the H8 now, I think, as well. That's the the latest one. Oh, and it's kind of like got the things coming out, like kind of. Yeah, it looks like an octopus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> an octopus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, well, look, that, that 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 that's the biggest testament to how good the the H two is that you keep on using it. 50, what, Fifteen years later, I suppose. 15, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Madness. Absolute madness. What about all the Paul Simon stuff then? The Paul Simon show. How did that come about? Um. So I, I've sort of had a, a long history uh, with the music of Paul Simon at this point. Um. I. Uh, so Paul Simon recorded a Davy Graham uh, tune called Angie that I think pretty much every guitarist in the UK is probably aware of. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's less commonly known, but still still a rite of passage in the US. And uh, so when I first started playing guitar, that was that was one of my first benchmarks. You know, I I wanted to be able to play Angie, and um, I knew it off of the Simon and Garfunkel record. But in the liner notes, it mentions that it was by a British guitar player named Davy Graham. So I, uh, uh, you know, I, I wound up going down the road of Davy Graham sort of more so after that. Um, but it was because of this. So, you know, it was this Davy Graham song played by Paul Simon that was one of the reasons I wanted to start playing guitar. I wanted to play that song. And uh, and so, you know, I was just listening to Simon and Garfunkel throughout the years and uh, and was sort of casually interested in, in Paul Simon and his music. And, and I liked a lot of his guitar writing and his arrangements. Um, but it wasn't until I got to college that a friend introduced me to the Graceland album. Um, and it, it just completely rocked my world when I heard it for the first time. It was just like the most perfect pop music I had like ever listened to. Um, and so I, I became really steeped in that album and, uh, my junior year, my, I, I guess I should say my second or third year, my third year uh, at university, I recorded a video of myself singing and playing Graceland off of that album. Um, and I had worked up an arrangement of it on, on guitar such that, you know, the guitar was, uh, all of the accompaniment basically condensed down onto one instrument. And then I was singing and then I had like a little amplified foot stomping block thing. Yeah. And, um, and my channel was, I mean, a 10th the size of what it is now or less, uh, at that time. But, um, some people posted that performance of Graceland onto Reddit and, uh, and it wound up, uh, being catching the attention of some producers of a, of a uh, national morning TV show here in the U S called good morning America. And, um, so I, I went and performed that song on Good Morning America, and uh, it was, to be honest, kind of a corny like shtick that they had for this for that yeah. segment. But um, but I think it lent me a certain amount of credibility to to potential employers and stuff. It's like, oh, that's the guy who was on TV doing Paul Simon, right? Yeah. Um, and a lot of people seem to think that I sound, you know, my 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 voice sounds pretty similar to his, and so. Um, 
because I got to do th- that TV appearance, uh, I later got called up to basically play the same arrangement um, on a, a symphony pops show uh, in Indianapolis while I was in college. And then, um, and then that sort of led to um, me being asked to audition for um, a nationally touring Simon and Garfunkel tribute show uh, called the Simon and Garfunkel story that y- you guys actually have a UK cast of as well. That that was the right. original version of it. Um, and when they first brought it to the US, they asked me if I wanted to be um, the, the, you know, the Paul in the show. Um, and uh, I wasn't available for it the first year. And then the second year they had cast somebody else uh, who they, who they liked. And I wound up getting uh, the role as the guitarist in the band for that show, um, which honestly I was e- equally happy with because I yeah. don't really have any acting experience and it was a stage show enough that, you know, I was more happy to kind of be in the band on it anyway. Um, so I toured uh, on and off for about two years with that show. Um, and while I was in the midst of doing that, the gentleman from the, uh, the UK, uh, a guy named Dean Elliott, who was the original producer of the UK version of the show, uh, you know, he, he reached out to me and said, Hey, we're thinking of doing another Paul Simon related show, uh, that I want to kind of pilot here in the UK. That's going to be just the album Graceland. And, uh, and we've got like the South African choir and, and, you know, we've got some venues lined up. And so, um, so yeah, so in 2019, I, I got to tour the UK with a Graceland tribute show where I, I actually was the, um, the Paul in that show. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, it was amazing. We had a, um, like a six piece band, I think with a horn player. And then we had a, um, an eight person, uh, South African choir, um, that, you know, they all live in the UK, but they're all, um, transplants from South Africa. And, uh, cool. and that was, it was, I mean, it was one of the most amazing experiences I've ever had. Like we, I mean, we were like the, we, I, if there, if there's ever been a better tribute to that album, I would be, I'd be very surprised. And I, and I, I don't mean that to toot my own horn. It was truly the, the whole, you know, everybody was, was, was just putting uh, a ton of work into that yeah. making it really special. And, uh, even like the sound guy was getting the gated snare drum sounds and things like that, you know? And, uh, and yeah, I mean, but unfortunately it was an extremely expensive, uh, show to produce. And so it, I think was probably just a one-time thing. Um, but, but yeah, so my, my, I've, I've, I've had a sort of, I've, my career has been interwoven with Paul Simon and, and Paul Simon tributes over the years. And luckily I, I really love his music. I think he's a brilliant songwriter and, uh, yeah. Yeah. So well, one one of my favorite covers uh, of yours again. I, I feel like that's like the tenth time I've said one of my favorite covers of yours. Boy, it genuinely is is uh, diamonds on the soles of her shoes, and you do like a it was a, oh, yeah. like a blue a bluegrass cover. I'd never heard that song until I, I used to live in Spain, working in uh, and singing in Irish pubs. And uh, the second year that I was there, there was this uh, English guy called Richie. Richie, if you're listening, hello there, pal. And he used to do a lot of uh, Simon and Garfunkel stuff. He used to play barefoot. Um, and he used to apparently, like, like we were in Salou, which is like about an hour, an hour and a half south of Barcelona. And Richie used to live like up in the hills in Barcelona as like a hippie. And he was the coolest guy going. But he played Diamonds on the Soles of Her Shoes. And it was the first time I ever heard it. And I thought it was so, so cool. And I went and looked it up then after hearing Richie playing it the next day. And I came across your... Uh, is that right? Ah, I came across your cover at some point anyway, and I yeah. thought it was um I thought it was was so so cool and so um original and the, the bluegrass element of it worked so so well. I'm sorry I never got to see the show when it was in Aberdeen, but um leading on from that, so what are some of the like coolest places that you've you've gigged in? Oh gosh. Uh well, um so uh, I mentioned doing a symphony show uh, after I got that sort of random TV appearance. Um, and the the symphony show, uh, the, the first place that we performed it, uh, I, I think you guys probably have a similar thing to this uh, in, in the UK and in Ireland, where so during, during the nicer months of the year, symphonies will perform outside in, in big amphitheaters on lawns and all that. And, you know, and it's either, either free or relatively inexpensive. And, and oftentimes the programs are, you know, are either pop music or, or, uh, very accessible classical music and so on. Um, so it was one of those type of things. And, uh, and so the first time that I really ever, you know, it, it was, it was a very surreal experience because I played that song for a camera, you know, in a living room alone. Um, 
in while I was in university. And then the first place that I performed it live was on national TV um, with, you know, a load of cameras and, and all these hosts who've got a ton of makeup on and stuff sitting right next to me watching me do it. And then the third time I played it live uh, was uh, in sitting in front of the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra um, with a lawn with about 5,000 people on it uh, sitting in front of me. And I was so nervous. <laughs> I, was, I, I think I played it probably about 30 BPM faster than the studio version, um, you know, but uh, because my heart was going a million miles a minute. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, I had, you know, but I had a, a really a good time with it. And, and, you know, and, and the nice thing about that is that once you've had that type of experience a couple of times, it makes other performances seem a lot more manageable by comparison. So that was that was definitely a high watermark. Um, and, you know, and then and then later on getting to do the Graceland show. I mean, we, we played it. Um, uh at o2 shepherd's bush uh which uh shepherd's bush empire which you know if you've ever been backstage at venues it's very common for bands to um leave a note of the fact that they've played there and you know i saw that david bowie had played there uh in their early 2000s or something like that and it's just like well better not screw this up you know <laughs> uh, exactly yeah um, it's so so cool isn't it yeah, yeah, but uh, but that that was that was a really neat uh, neat place to play. Um, with the uh, and then yeah, I mean a lot of the time just getting to play places where um, heroes of mine have played is always really special. So on the U.S. Uh, Simon and Garfunkel tribute, we got to play the the very last show I actually played before the pandemic was at the the Pantages Theater in Los Angeles, um, which is where um, the Stop Making Sense concert film was made, uh, the Talking Heads uh, concert film from 1984. That's one of my absolute favorite movies. And so, getting to play on that stage uh, was it was an equally surreal and wonderful experience. And um, I mean, you know, it, like I, I'm 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 enumerating all of these sort of grand, elaborate uh, places, but you know, the the vast majority of where I've played has been much much smaller and more intimate. And um, yeah, I, I guess in terms of the rush of it, playing big halls is really cool. But in terms of the connection that I feel with the audience, a lot of smaller places um, is often much more uh, fulfilling. I just the, the the one of the last big shows I played of this year uh, was with Carson and it was with Raina and Tony as well and we played at a place called the Button Factory in um, in uh, the Temple Bar in Dublin and the Button uh, Factory and that, that, I know it very very well very well I used yeah, to walk yeah. past it every I used to walk past it every single day going to college and then going back to the bus I know it's so yeah, well it's and it's it's a lovely place they had a great sound guy and uh, and 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 a room like that which is you know I think it was maybe four about four hundred people were there where you can really pretty much see everybody's face individually and, you know, and they were very excited, but then they really hush up, you know, when the music starts and things like that. Um, and those people, they had waited, you know, for two years, we had postponed that tour. Um, yeah. and, and they still came back out in numbers. And, uh, and so, yeah, so s smaller rooms, uh, rooms like that where you can really see and connect with people are, um, are just as wonderful. I don't know. I love performing basically anywhere. So, yeah. you know. Brilliant. When, when you were in Temple Bar, did you go out afterwards? Did you go for a pint or anything? Um, so, uh, the, I first visited Ireland, uh, on just on holiday in 2014 and, and I did the touristy thing in Temple Bar at that time and was not, was not greatly inclined to, to do that again. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, we, 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 we actually, we actually tried to go out for a pint after the show. Um, but all of the, all of the pubs had closed down by the time that we had gotten our, everything out of the venue and it was just the clubs that were open and that, that's not really my scene. So, oh, no, um, no. the night after we, uh, I, I did actually go get a pint at a place that I should give a shout out to a place called the cobblestone pub, uh, in Dublin. Um, and that, uh, that place is, was absolutely wonderful. It was, I don't know, about a mile or so away from, a uh, mile and a half maybe from Temple Bar area but yeah. um they were hosting a th there's a an organization of uh Ilian Pipers that that was hosting a like a, a ticketed concert in the back of the pub um and there was a there was a fellow named uh Blackie O'Connell uh who was from somewhere in County Clare who was who was playing and uh, and that was really really amazing and it was it was nice to feel like I was at least in a minority uh as a tourist in the room you know which in Dublin can be a bit tough sometimes <laughs> very very tough <laughs> um, yeah so uh so so yeah that was that was lovely but yeah I mean you know so so places like Button Factory and even smaller you know I've I've played plenty of uh coffee shops and and rooms with you know 50 people in them or less and um I don't know just playing music in front of people is I, I the the pandemic taught me a lot of things and, and gratitude for playing for a real audience after doing a bunch of live streams was was definitely mm. one of them yeah I, I I I couldn't agree with you more it was it was great that we were able to do it and it was great that the technology was there 10 years ago 
in the middle of a, a pandemic, us that, that that rely on live music for, for yeah, a living. We would have been, been, been screwed. Yeah, completely. And it was fine. <laughs> it was cool. It was good that we were able to do it. But like you say, there's just, there's, there's nothing like it. I play in some places here in Aberdeen and I play in one place in particular and I love playing there. But it's so, so big and so, so long that like, you'll be having the crack with the few people that are in front of you here, but the people that are way, way down the back have right, no idea right. what's going on. No idea whatsoever. As opposed to another place I play in Aberdeen where you play up on a bit of a stage and you can see every single person in the place and they can see you. So you can be having the crack with the two lads in front of you here, but then the, the, the lads down the back can still see everything that's going on. And yeah, the yeah. atmosphere, it, 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 yeah, you just don't get that over over a live stream. As I say, you're 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 happy to have had it, but it's that... That's fine. It was it was better than nothing, but uh, than nothing. oh boy, not uh, not exactly. great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But hey ho, hopefully uh, we'll never have to rely on that ever again. But um, at the moment, what are you um, what are you working on just now? I remember I, I asked you before we started re- recording that you're in between projects. But uh, that's right. Uh, yeah. What, so what, I mean, what are you up to? I think like a lot of musicians. Um, I think you know the the ending of the pandemic. Um, everybody was kind of just so desperate to. Um, to get back at it that, um, that I might've overbooked myself a little bit this past year. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Um, so, you know, in the, in the course this year, I mean, I put out a full length album, I put out, um, an EP of new original music. Uh, I was on the road for about four months. I put out about 36 videos on my channel, uh, and then appeared on, you know, uh, probably a dozen videos on other people's channels as well. Um, busy, busy. Yeah. I drove, uh, I drove across the U S and back, uh, one one of the on one of those tours which is about 10,000 miles uh, about what 160,000 kilometers i guess uh jeez it's pro- probably about right yeah or no sorry uh, not no sorry 16,000 kilometers not 160 yeah. a, i literally excellent. just ju- i literally just totted up my mileage there for the last year and i done i think two and a half thousand miles in the entire year and you've done yeah. that for, <laughs> you've done what four or five times that for that's right one, that's mad yeah, yeah, um, and uh, and we were doing it in February and March, which uh, you know we we get some real weather here, so uh, it was yeah. it was it was some interesting driving. But anyway, um, all that is to say, it's been a really big year, and uh, ever since I finished my last big tour in uh, in early October, um, I've, I've relatively been taking it easy and and kind of uh, you know just just trying to trying to remember how to rest <laughs> i yeah. guess because like the 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 pressure has been on so much to to just get out do as much as you possibly can uh since the pandemic has been over that uh that i have to remember that it's it's okay to not have you know a project going on it's okay to to not have a deadline like looming yeah. over me and, and stuff like that and uh yeah and then yeah. you know and and now that i've had that that time um i'm uh, i've been plotting uh so my my wife and i work together uh she films all of my videos and uh she oh. manages me and manages the channel um uh, we we started working together actually right before the pandemic and um and so she and i have been kind of scheming together about what uh what would be fun for the coming year and for a long time on my youtube channel i think like many people i would shoot a video and then mm-hmm. post it shoot a video post it shoot a video post it yeah. And that that starts to feel pretty um, Sisyphean, you know, after you've been doing it for a certain number of years. And so we, in the last two years, have really tried to move towards working in larger scale projects um, that we can then release in bulk on YouTube, basically. Yeah. So you record something intensively over the course of, say, three weeks, and then you release it over the course of uh, three months, you know, yeah. in, in the in the latter half of that same year or something like that. Yeah. Um, it's something, frankly, something that looks a little bit more like the the schedule upon which people usually release albums, you know? Yeah. You, yeah. you, you record it, you know, over the couple of, over a couple of weeks, and then, and then you have to uh, get it mixed and mastered and you come up with art and everything like that. And then six months, a year down the road, it, it gets released and then you're in the, the release process of that with the touring and all the rest of it for, you know, several months or up to a year. So, um, so that's, that's, that's the approach we've been trying to take. And so the next project that we want to do, uh, is a, is a solo guitar record. Um, it feels a little bit overdue for me actually, because I've been interested in solo guitar, um, since I first started to play the first video I ever posted on my channel was a, was a solo guitar video. And, um, I think for a long time I, I've held off on that idea because I, um, it didn't really feel like I maybe had much to add to the conversation. You know, I, th- I think yeah. there's just so much great solo guitar music out there. I was afraid, um, 
you know, of not really having my own voice and, and of, and of just kind of copying my influences basically. But, um, that's something that I've kind of struggled with in general as somebody who's mm. built a lot of their career off of recording covers, you know, I've, I've yeah, yeah. sort of w- like tr- one trying to find my own voice and then, and then in, in moments of greater despair, wondering, you know, if I even have one or if I'm capable of, of anything other than regurgitation, basically. I know what you mean. Um, yeah. But, uh, but you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to, um, trying to quiet that voice in my head and, and just trust that, you know, uh, I can probably come up with, something that somebody will like <laughs> yeah I'm and, sure you uh, would. and so yeah so that's so that's what i've been up to i've been i've been writing uh for the most part uh during during these past few months and i'm, I'm hopeful that in the first couple of months of the new year uh, i'll be able to start recording that and um yeah and then allison young and i uh are looking to hopefully do some more touring next year we did sort of a trial run tour in the uk um this this past july mm-hmm. um we were there just in time for the, the heat wave uh which was which was quite a quite a treat <laughs> yeah it, um, it was it was chronic because i we, we, we've just myself and my wife had just had had a baby girl there in, in april and trying to keep her cool oh and man. when we we're, we're not geared up for air conditioning at all we don't that's have right, air conditioning right. uh i know i i'm in a little essentially for all intents and purposes a shed out in my back garden and because i've got oh, it must have been brutally here, hot man it's oh like I, I, i've i've gotten don't know if you can see there you can't see it's not in the picture but i've i had to get air conditioning installed um, and yeah. because I've, yeah. i i one 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 afternoon noon here i had a young fella nearly passing out from the heat because he, oh, there's Lord. no way of cooling it down because even if you open the door it's just hot air coming in if you put a fan right. it's just blowing hot <laughs> air in their face it's just it was a disaster like it was lovely for some of it but it was yeah we, we we're not geared up for it over this end of the world at all yeah yeah it was uh it was it was interesting actually being over there for that because uh because you know of course i we're used to quite a bit more heat here in the in the states but um and and, and it did actually i mean the, the the real danger is is just all the unair conditioned spaces but you know mm-hmm. but but there were outside temperatures that to us were just like well it feels like summertime you know and people yeah. were just like oh stay safe you know <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh but anyway yeah so so that was i was touring with allison young in july during the heat wave and uh, and she and i are um we, we got a, a really strong response um from the from the lovely folks in the uk that we that we played for and so we're hoping to uh keep pursuing that in the coming year uh we released an ep last year and we um, we're going to be releasing something in, in the coming year. We're not exactly sure what that's going to look like yet, but, um, yeah, we're hoping to do some more original music and, and hopefully some touring in support of it. So, uh, solo guitar and, uh, and Josh and Allison are, are probably the big projects for the new year. Yes, you're, 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 you're absolutely flat out. I thought I was busy, but my God, you are so busy. You've got so much on the go and that's all, it all sounds absolutely fantastic. I really hope that when you come over to the UK, you stick an Aberdeen date on because I'll be there front and center. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I, uh, I went to a really excellent, uh, whiskey bar the last time I was in Aberdeen as well after the show. Uh, and hopefully I can, hopefully I can make it back there. Oh, what was it called? Oh gosh. What was it called? Uh, they had, they had music and there was an old, an old fellow who st- stood up and sang wild mountain time, uh, at the end of it, which was, a, which was a lovely thing because, uh, one of the, uh, one of the, f- one of the fellows on the show, um, the drummer was a, he was, he was a great fan of Scotch whiskey, and he knew that I liked bourbon and wanted, you yeah. know, and was basically telling me that you couldn't get any good Scotch in the U.S. and that he was going to, you know, show me where you could get the good stuff. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm really intrigued now. I'm really, really intrigued. Um, yeah, cool. We'll, we'll, we'll figure that out. And if you find out, ju- just, just send me a message, and I um, I'll, I'll know who it is because the likelihood of it is that I know exactly who was playing there that night you were in because all the musicians in Aberdeen we're all in a big group chat um so we all know each other um, that's excellent yeah it's it, it's a really good community of musicians actually in aberdeen um so it's it's I'm, I'm quite fortunate here where i am um cool so just before we finish up then josh if you were to give any advice because this is what this podcast is all about is helping people um start their career in music maybe kickstart their career in music whatever you want to call it what advice would you give to someone that's looking up to you now and wants to do what what you do how did it start out completely from scratch um it that's always a it's always a tough question for me just mm. because the 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 world of music is changing so fast yeah right now um that you know i'm 30 um and i started making youtube videos when i was 15 yeah. and even just in that 
basically decade and a half window, you know, adv- advice that applied when I was getting started d- did, you know, doesn't really apply yep. much at all anymore. More. Yeah. And in 2007, you know, somebody, if I had, to, if I had told somebody I was going to make a career chiefly off of YouTube, they would have scratched their heads because there was no money to be made on YouTube in 2007. Of course, you know? yeah. Um, so I, I guess that's the, the big caveat with which I need to start, I guess, what I'm about to say. But yeah. um, I don't see any way forward in the music industry that doesn't involve a great deal of uh posting on social media i think i I think that you you just you just really have to kind of embrace it unfortunately at this point and i say unfortunately because of course um it can be difficult to have a healthy relationship with social media and if you're posting on it a lot you're probably also looking at it a lot and so on and and you know and you have to be quite conscious to make sure that um you're continuing to view it as a tool uh more than anything else um you know i i you know I, i use instagram as a um as as basically a contact list these days of either people that I would like to work with or have worked with, and that's that's kind of all that I use it for. And then I post whatever I think I kind of have to post. Yeah. Um. But you know, so getting getting a decent um a decent recording setup for yourself, um, learning enough about it that you can be heard and seen clearly, and then and then mm-hmm. trying to post regularly as uh, on as many platforms as possible is, um. I think a really important part of, of getting started these days. And, and I, I wish that I could give advice like, you know, study Bach or something more interesting and, and, yeah. and, and <laughs> more music related, you know, but um, it's just such a uh, double-edged sword, the extent to which um, musicians themselves have become responsible for the distribution and promotion of their music. You know, yeah. on the one hand, it's, it's, it's great that there is, I think a lot less gatekeeping, you know, um, there, mm there's gatekeeping if you want to be on, you know, radio one, but you yeah. can build, you can build a career for yourself entirely on your own without a label and and so on in a way that you really couldn't do in the past. And you can get your music to an enormous number of years. But the flip side of that is that it takes a lot of, uh, basically just spamming people constantly, yeah, with, yeah. you know, with, with your music and, and what, what may feel like, um, you know, an unnatural barrage of content to you uh is exactly what the algorithm favors and uh and you know will make you more likely to be placed in front of a lot of eyes um and ears and so on and and you know i actually think that there is something to be said for the fact that so much of social media is a visual medium as well because Mm -hmm. fans who can see you as well as hear you uh i think it i think it immediately develops or can develop a deeper connection with you and your music than, than if it's audio only, um, people who come to my shows oftentimes, you know, I very often hear like, Oh, I feel like I know you, you know, if like watched you grow up and stuff like that, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, a closeness and uh, a devotion, I think to, to my channel and my music and my journey that these people have just because of the fact that the, the visual medium, uh, because of social media has, has been such a part of the way that they've experienced it. Yeah. So, you know, I guess the, the way, the, the way that I would summarize that my, my concluding paragraph of my, of my essay here is, um, you know, uh, use social media consciously, but, uh, but post regularly. I think that's, that's kind of what it comes down to if you're, if you're trying to get started. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. I'm also a 30 and, um, the stuff that I learned, um, in sound engineering, uh, college back 12, 13, 15 years ago, however long ago it was, is now still not, 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 not necessarily redundant, but irrelevant. Oh. Because do you know what I mean? Well, I, well, I was learning about I was learning about how to wire up patch bays, you know. And I was yeah. just it's like nobody needs that, you know. Signal flow. We used there was signal a whole flow. yeah, there was a whole <laughs> lecture that we had to do on signal flow. And we had to be able to <coughs> excuse me, we had to be able to um replicate perfectly the signal flow of the uh the Rembrandt, the AMAC Rembrandt desk that we had in our um in our studio. For what? So yeah, so need, needless to say, you're using that every day now, huh? Oh, absolutely every day. Oh, it's it's. It, I, I wake up and I brush my teeth in the morning. I go through signal flow from from preamp <laughs> to to fader light. Do you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, like all those things that we were learning about are completely and utterly redundant because we have things like even like I even this this week. Um, I I came across um well a, co- a couple of weeks ago I came across a, a software called Descript for editing um podcasts and for for editing these podcasts and for editing videos and stuff and what it does is if you upload a recording 
it'll transcribe the recording into what is essentially a Word document. And you can edit your video and your audio from this Word no. document. So oh, if that's I, so crazy. It's mental. So if I say, oh, thanks very much, um, Josh Murphy, for coming on, on, on the show today. Oh, sorry, your name isn't Josh, Josh Murphy. Hang on, I'll edit that out. Thanks very much, Josh Turner, for coming on the show. I'll then see that in the transcript. I don't even need to listen to it. I can literally see that I said, that Barry has said, oh, thanks very much, Josh Murphy. I'll highlight it, delete it, like I would a Word document, and then it, it, it updates in the audio and oh, the video nuts, man. seamlessly. Seamlessly. You know, it, I, thought, I thought I was going to be older than 30 when I started being incredulous about the pace of technology. I, I, I thought yeah. that started when you were 40 or 50, but here we are. Here we are. Yeah, I know. It, <laughs> it, 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 it's crazy. So all those things that I like, even like I was I was still using Logic two weeks ago. And even mm-hmm. the way that I'm doing things in Logic two weeks ago is now completely and utterly out of date and redundant because I can just do it. It's it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. So, yeah, that, that is really good advice. Uh, and I think that is probably um, the best advice that to, to use social media to your advantage consciously. Um, and yeah. I think that's really, really good advice. So thanks very much for that. Let's start um, finishing up here now. And um, we're going to hop into a quick fire round. So first off, in three words or less, what is your job title? Musician and YouTuber. Musician and YouTuber. (laughs) I like it. Um, Cool. Is there any words that you find hard to pronounce? Hmm. Yeah. uh, Rural. That's that one's that one's a pain. What was it? Uh, I I don't know actually. Uh, I, I think this may be one that's actually pronounced a bit differently in in uh, like UK English. Rural, R U R A L. Oh, rural, rural. See, if you say it with an Irish accent, it's actually easier to say. If you say it with an American accent, it's pretty hard. <laughs> so what? What? what you're saying rural? Is that what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, rural. I give it, it. It's like the way that I right. Okay, so what's that? What's that glass thing that you look into and you can see yourself back in? Uh, a mirror? Yeah, I say mirror. Mirror. Yeah. Yeah, so there you go. Say, say, and and that, was, that, one's, that one's easier in American English, a mirror, because you get that, that more distinguished vowel sound on the, in the yeah. first syllable. And As rural. opposed to me saying, yeah, yeah. I have a yeah. look in the mirror there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, cool. Leading on from that, what's your favorite word? Mm. Oh, gosh. I don't know that I have like one categorical favorite word. The first word that came to mind that I think is a nice word is um, velvet. It's one of those oh. words that, that sounds like what it that sounds like what it is. You know, yeah. and velvet itself is a lovely thing. So velvet. Yeah. I, I I always think that's a really really good um, criteria for deciding what your favorite word is. Like what mm. is what is nice to say and what's nice to hear. Um, yeah, I love it. That velvet. Oh yeah, very good. Um, what was your favorite subject in school? Um, well, aside from music, yeah, I was going to say probably music theory, uh, but um, uh, English, I think, probably. Oh, cool, good stuff. Yeah, you guys over there, from what I see in films, you 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 guys do English way way better than what we do. You you read like amazing novels and stuff, whereas we're stuck with like. Shakespeare and all that other shit that's completely utterly irrelevant nowadays. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, there, there were times where I, I actually wished that we had stuck to the canon at least a little bit, you know, more because I've, I've gotten to an age now where people are like, "Well, you've never read King Lear," and I'm like, "No." <laughs> oh, well, King Lear is good. He gets his eyes gouged out with a spoon. So I wouldn't know. Oh well, there you but go. No, you regardless, don't. I, I enjoyed English quite a lot. All right, good stuff. I, I also enjoyed English. So that's good stuff. Um, Disney character, who would you be? If you if you could be any Disney character, Disney kind of is 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 an umbrella term for like cartoon character. If you want, mm. um, I would be, uh, you know, I've never thought about any of these questions before. I know um, it's, it's 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 good, isn't it? I literally just when I started doing the podcast, I was like, I googled like quick fire round questions because I think that's just so much fun to, to to see how people's brains work when they're put under pressure with like a ridiculously stupid question that would never come up in any other real life grown up setting. Okay. Well, my favorite, my favorite, the cartoon character that I would like to be, um, this, this may not resonate with people. So I'll, 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 I'll give that first and then I'll hone it back in a bit more towards Disney. The, okay. the cartoon character that I'd like to be, there was, there was a cartoon called, um, 
Adventure Time that was that was quite popular here in the U.S. for a while. Um, I don't know if okay. it ever aired in the U.K., but there's a there's a character named Jake the dog um, that uh, I'm I'm quite fond of. Jake uh, Jake the dog can can shape shift and does all sorts of really wacky things, and he's this sort oh, cool. of like he's this sort of just like a degenerate uncle character in the form of a cartoon dog that can shape shift, and that to me is just really delightful. Um, it, but that would be a bit more familiar to people. Um, Frozone from The Incredibles, uh, I think, would be a really fun character to be. Um, is that um, is that Samuel voiced, L. Jackson? That's right. He's voiced by Samuel yes. L. Jackson. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Yeah, he's he's so suave in the film. I love it. That's right. That's really cool. Okay, cool. Let's do two more. So, because you said at the start you would be doing car design, if you could have any car and and money was no object and all this kind of crack, what would you have? Um. I have a lot of like subcategory answers to that question, but I think the number one car, like my, my number one dream car from when I was a kid that I would still love to own uh, is a, an E39 BMW M5, uh, which was the one they were making between 1999 and 2003. Um, okay. That one, yeah, very, very specific answer, but... Uh, That's very yeah, specific. That, 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 uh, that to me is just one of the, the, the prettiest BMWs ever made. Uh, and I just love, I love how mundane and understated it looks from the outside while having basically a... Uh, a racing engine, you know, in it, it looks, it just looks like a, it looks like a, a, a car, you know, an executive would have driven 20 years ago, but it, but it goes like hell and uh, it's got a six speed manual and all the rest of it. So yeah, that. Cool. Okay. Very good. I was expecting something along the, I, I was not expecting a BMW. I would have expected something along the lines of like a Mustang or a, a Charger or something cool and American, but no, yeah, that's um, the, the muscle cars. I, I like some muscle cars, but I like cars that can handle better personally. Oh, well, fair play to you. you. You've got a bit of sense about you, as my dad would say. My dad, <laughs> my, my dad's a mechanic and, and his, his ideal car is the one he has. He's got an Audi A5 and that that's, he, he, he loves that. Or he was, he loved that or he loves an, an Audi Quattro. Um, whereas I would be along the lines of like, ah, I'm making a mess of my studio here now because my thingy is stuck of uh, like a DeLorean. That's what I oh, have yeah. because just because of that and that alone, because that's oh, just yeah. the coolest thing in the world. It's, it's, um, it's a trend here. It's, it's a small trend here in the US of people who, um, who are, have started putting Corvette motors inside DeLoreans. And that would be a pretty fun car. Oh, I, cause yeah. the DeLorean was like notoriously unreliable. Slow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, slow, slow yeah. and unreliable. And because it was built pretty much in a war zone in Northern Ireland back in the 80s. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, hey, oh, cool, right. Last one, last one. And this is the million dollar question. I always ask people this one. What would you be doing if you weren't a musician? Although I feel like we've just answered that one. But anyway, what would you be doing if you weren't a musician and YouTuber? Mm, yeah, it would have to be something in the in the car world. Uh, I don't know. I, I might have gone to technical school and, and uh you know, try to become a mechanic or, or, you know, a salesman at a luxury car dealership or something like that. I don't know. Um, I don't, I don't think I ever would have had the, the acumen to actually work on the design side of, of cars, but somewhere in the auto industry, actually, actually, no, I, I have a better answer to that question. Automotive okay. journalism. That, that was Ooh. something that I considered very seriously for a while. Um, I was, I would have, I it was an avid fan of, uh, of the classic top gear and, uh, and a fifth gear and, and, you know, and then in the U S here we have a uh, car and driver and motor trend and, and there are magazines like that, that I would have absolutely loved to have uh, been a part of. So brilliant. I grew up watching top gear, classic top gear with Clarkson Hammond and May. That's right. Yeah. Um, and oh, I, I grew up loving, I, I, I love top gear. I still love, it. I love all, have you seen, um, the grand tour, grand and tour. Stuff on Amazon? Oh, fantastic. Absolutely yeah, it, brilliant. It doesn't have the same, it doesn't have the same, um, sort of Charm. absurd like scrappiness to me that the that the top gear had you know but um yeah it's yeah. a bit it's a, there's a little too much window dressing on it i think for me but um, yeah i i agree with you it's almost it's because when, when top gear was on bbc they kind of they had to rein themselves in a little bit but they would always like be pushing it that little bit more just that little bit but now mm -hmm. that they're on amazon prime and they pretty much have free reign to do whatever they want it's almost like it doesn't have like what you're saying the same yeah. sort of I don't know what you'd call it. it, it feel, if, yeah, it feels a little bit like the dog that's caught the car at this point. Yeah, you know? yeah, that that's a really good way of putting it. But ah, hey ho, um, <laughs> cool, right? Well, that's that, that that's fantastic, Josh. Before we finish up, um, where can people find you? 
Uh, people can find me on uh, YouTube at uh, Josh Turner Guitar, uh, not to be mistaken with the famous American country singer Josh Turner. Uh, I'm the one who does not have a beard, which you can't tell if you're uh, just listening to the podcast. Um, and uh, you can also find me on Spotify as Joshua Lee Turner. I'm on Instagram as uh, at Joshua underscore Lee underscore Turner. And uh, yeah, then I've that's YouTube. Uh, the YouTube channel can lead you to many other places, many other side projects. And uh, keep an eye out for some solo guitar music in the in the next couple of months. Fantastic! I'm looking forward to it, Josh. Thank you very much for your time today. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you, Barry. Likewise. <laughs>